Hello everyone, this is Heidi Tierney with the Water Environment Federation. I want to welcome each of you to the Pipeline Assessment and Certification Program webcast. Before we begin, I would like to quickly review a few logistics. The PDF PowerPoint presentations are now available for downloading at WEF's website. This link was included in the GoToWebinar reminder emails an hour before the webcast and will be included in the follow-up emails in an hour after the webcast is ended. These reminder emails also included a link for the Webcast Professional Development Hour instructions for those eligible to receive these training credits. There are two PDH credits available for this webcast. You will need to complete the evaluation form to receive the PDH certificate. Your feedback on this webcast is important and helps identify future webcast topics that are timely and helpful to you. Please follow the PDH instructions and check with your state accreditation agency on how to receive this training credit. During this webcast, while you cannot speak directly to the presenters, you will have an opportunity to submit questions by typing your specific question into the GoToWebinar pane that appears on the right-hand side of your computer screen. Today's moderator, Ted DeBoda, will be accumulating questions and direct them to presenters. We will be recording this webcast. The webcast recording link will be available on the webcast website within 48 hours after the event. If you have any additional questions after the webcast is ended, please email webcast with an S at web.org. I would like to thank Ted for moderating today's webcast. Ted DeBoda is the Executive Director at NASCO. Ted? Thanks, Heidi. First, we want to thank the sponsors of this webcast, Jack DeHaney Companies and T4 Spatial. These companies have both been very involved in PACP, and you'll have the opportunity to hear more about them at the end of the webcast. I want to take a few minutes to introduce NASCO and PACP as well as the efforts that we've taken uh, over the past two years to update it. NASCO's mission for almost 40 years has been to set industry standards for the assessment and rehabilitation of underground infrastructure and to assure the continued acceptance and growth of trenchless technologies. The NASCO Pipeline Assessment Certification Program was established in 2002 to provide standardization and consistency to the way we evaluate our underground infrastructure. For those of us that were around at that time, there was no standardized protocol in the U.S. for collection and management of data collected from internal pipeline inspection. So collection system owners either created their own individual systems or they just allowed each operator to collect data using no standard at all. Since 2002, NASCO certified over, over 20,000 PACP users. And PACP has now been adapted for use with other pipe systems such as stormwater, and dam and levee pipe systems. Version 6.0, which is the version that's, that's currently out, was released in 2010. And we've tracked comments on the program since that release. For the past two years, we've had over 50 webinar meetings, conference calls, including over 65 industry experts to review the entire program page by page with emphasis on quality photos, industry needs, current available technologies and training. Now, NASCO's cost for the two-day PACP program will be increased uh, from $750 to $800. MACP, LACP will increase from $150 to $175. And recertification will, inc will increase $25 based on whether you're a member or non-member. Manual costs are $110 whether ordered uh, for recertification or just as a replacement. We're currently on track to start training for PACP 7.0 on May 1st, 2015. Now, from that point on, no version 6.0 training or manuals will be available. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to ask questions. I'll be monitoring your questions, and we'll have time between the presentations, actually in the middle and at the end, to present some of the questions to the panel and answer them online. Some of the key points in this webcast include PACP and the regulatory requirements presented by Gina Snyder, PACP 7.0 for pipelines presented by Luis Leon, updates to MACP and LACP presented by Laurie Perkins, and updates to the appendices presented by Jim, Jim Harris. Now we do have an excellent group of speakers today, and again, Gina Snyder from EPA Region 1, Luis Leon of CDM Smith, Laurie Perkins of Wright Pierce, and Jim Harris of Harris Analysis. Our first presenter will be Gina Snyder. Gina is a PE environmental engineer with the Environmental Protection Agency Region 1 in New England. Gina is an environmental engineer in the Assistance and Pollution Prevention Office 
at EPA New England, and in her 25 plus years at EPA, Gina's worked with municipalities, state governments, trade groups, businesses, and educational institutions. In her current position at EPA Region 1, Gina works on capacity management operations and maintenance, CMOM programs for wastewater. One thing that really stands out in Gina's bio is the training she provides on Clean Water Act permit issues, energy management, and asset management in wastewater, drinking water, and stormwater facilities that, that she trains operators, engineering consultants, municipal staff, and, and community officials in six of the New England states. Gina? Hey, good afternoon. This presentation is not going forward. Hmm. Um, click, there you go. Yeah, I got it. Uh, it, while it's focused on uh, compliance component of condition assessment, pipeline, manhole, or lateral assessment, I do want to point out that proceeding with condition assessment can much better prepare a system for other issues such as the impact of climate change and addressing them. So sewer collection systems are aging, and we find in New England that some systems are very old, having been built with technology such as shown in this historic sewer example. We nearly always find some systems in our classes that have pipes over 100 years old. But even in other areas of the country, many, many systems which were put in after World War II in the 40s and 50s, they're now approaching 70 years old. So this at leads to the question we ask our classes. If a collection system has pipes that are about to fail or cause blockages and no one knows about it, is it a problem? And maybe back in the day it might not have been. After all, sewers were built to overflow two centuries ago. But now whether a combined system like that in the photo I just showed or a separate sanitary system, overflows are targeted for compliance and uh, enforcement. And this is because around the turn of the past century, EPA was working on a rule to address the finding that the number of sanitary sewer overflows was, were increasing. Some might remember the CMOM rule that was withdrawn, but EPA reported to Congress in 2004 on these issues, the health issues, water quality issues, and many programs developed by states and health departments around the country to address overflows. So obviously, it's not just an issue of compliance. If you have polluted water running down the street, if your system has an overflow, you've got a cleanup on your hands with sometimes potential toxins. And beyond compliance issues, other people are affected by overflows. These issues can impact homeowners. You can have high insurance claims if you aren't keeping the sewage in the pipes. So EPA developed preventive maintenance outreach, which is also connected to our permits in, in New England. We ask our classes which, which of these shows an overflow. Pretty easy to categorize the one on the left, definitely an overflow, and this is not a recommended method for preventing it. But what about the one on the right? If there's a blockage in the main line causing the problem, then the one on the right is sanitary sewer overflow too. So now we come to condition assessment. Whether your sewers are 10 years old or 100, their condition will fall somewhere on this decay curve, and running to failure is not a good option. So let's take a minute to look at that asset management model using the decay curve. You want to know the condition of your pipes and manholes, your assets, and where you are on that failure curve will change over time. Condition grading with PACP, MAPC, LAPC is going to tell you where you are. And you want to use that to keep your assets at some minimum standard. Jim will be talking later about the addition of asset management to the certification program, which we've been very excited to see. So you want to use the assessment to track the condition, bring those assets up to standard, and determine when you need renewal. The organized numeric grading approach of PACP, MAPC, and uh, lateral assessment programs ideally suited to help track this information over time. Because when you don't keep the sewage in the pipes with or without a permit, it is a violation. This is from the Clean Water Act and the Code of Federal Regulations regarding facilities. Historically, NPDES permits focused on treatment plant effluent, but New England permits and many more state permits are directing attention to the rest of the facilities, all the structures that are used um, to convey this wastewater to the treatment plant. All facilities must be properly operated and maintained. That was a general duty clause, but now it's being cut.
covered with specific permit requirements. So the term we used, I said it earlier, is CMOM, Capacity Management Operations and Maintenance. And this is what I was talking about as response to the increasing number of overflows. The CMOM program will reduce overflows and also make sure response is faster and more efficient. Because CMOM also addresses capacity issues, it can reduce the impact of inflow and infiltration on treatment plant capacity. The region developed permit requirements, as did some of the states, with general topics that include mapping and assessment. And there's a lot more information on our website that addresses the preventive maintenance plan, which I'll talk about in a minute. But having a plan will help organize and prioritize the work you want to have done on your system. Particularly the use of PACP can address the permit requirement to assess capacity and condition. Just real quickly, here's the table of contents on our website. There's templates on our website. The link is right there. Um, you'll see there's an introduction in details. Um, the toolbox website has this. And um, even when you're doing preventive maintenance, you still are going to need to prepare for overflows, responding to them. There's, there's an appendix with editable response procedures. Um, but what I wanted to zero in on was the uh, sewer assessment work. Setting up the plan, which is required in the permit, this organizes the program. So it sets, sets the system up for conducting the assessment, whether it be PACP, MAC, or if you want to add in lateral assessment, the LAPC. This helps determine where to target maintenance and rehabilitation work. And it also informs resource needs and budget, the staff and resources that are required by the permit. And both this is both O&M and capital planning budget. Permanent is, the permit is not envisioning a static plan. As the system performs assessments, the program needs to keep up. Repairs, replacements, these will result in changes to maintenance and renewal schedules and programs. With a real focus on assessment of the system, all the issues listed on this slide can uh, lead to dry weather overflows. So that's part of the question we ask. Do you have any of these issues? Do you know whether you have any of these issues and how serious they might be? Again, if you focus on the rules, discharge their violation. This is um, a state example from the main discharge elimination permit and a focus on the O&M again. So you can imagine how things like roots in the system can cause blockages and backups. The system doesn't know if it has these problems if it doesn't take a look. And the grading and coding details in the PACP will help organize and prioritize the follow-up. Add a little grease to the roots and you have a real problem. So coding in these trouble spots using the maintenance code and the pipeline assessment program to track condition and prioritize maintenance also gives you a history over time which helps and you're making those decisions that you need to be making. You can have a brand new pipe or be at the far end of the spectrum for structural issues. But on the right, the right-hand side picture here is so far gone that a spot repair won't fix it. This collapse will have to be dug up. If an assessment program had identified this earlier, it's possible it could have been repaired with less expense. You won't have these issues. You can just Look for these pictures. They're all, all you see, and more and more of these uh, news articles come up. If you add infiltration, wet weather flow to the dry weather discharge problems, you have even more problems. Infiltration, those leaky, leaky pipes, PACP will help code the extent of this issue for the system manager to follow up. Those leaky pipes can aggravate maintenance problems. You add infiltration to fat soils and grease blockages, and you end up with an overflow. Using smoke testing in association with your assessment can provide evidence of leaky pipes and infiltration, but it doesn't indicate how severe the problem is. Since sewer laterals can be some of the leakiest pipes in a system, using lateral assessment that Lori will talk about more provides the real data that you need. Fixing the issue before it comes up problem is really at the top of the agenda for EPA. Our website links to some communities out there doing a lot to address the problem of leaky laterals. And I should probably note that many of these programs come from enforcement actions where the problem wasn't caught and fixed in time to avoid a violation. So here I have a link to a document on our toolbox website which consolidates some of the research done by EPA's Office of Research and Development on lateral programs. So, Back to the question, it's not okay to have an overflow. 
So why perform a condition assessment? Your buried infrastructure is valuable. Preserve it. It will help meet O&M and minimize costs and avoid unexpected costs of repairing a pipe after it fails. It's an investment. Manage your risks. Avoid emergencies and possible fines and use the assessment to prioritize repair needs and infrastructure replacement projects and plan for the future. Because you know what's really risky? Not having information. Condition assessment will give you the information you need to make an informed decision. CAPC, MAPC, LAPC programs, they can really help keep a system in compliance. So now I'll turn it back to Ted for our next speaker. Thanks, Dina. Our next presenters, uh, the next three presenters are all PACP certified trainers, and, and all three have been instrumental in the update of PACP. Just a note, I, I saw some of the questions come up about um, the uh, quality of the audio. So if the speakers can just speak kind of loud and clearly and um, yeah, that would be helpful. So our next presenter will be Luis Leon to discuss PACP 7.0, specifically uh, for pipelines. Mr. Leon has over 29 years of experience in U.S. and international engineering and management in the areas of master planning, feasibility studies, modeling, asset management, design, including plan specs and estimates, permitting, and construction management of infrastructure projects. Projects include wastewater collection systems, water distribution facilities, storm drainage, transportation systems, and land development. He has particular expertise in pipeline design and rehabilitation using innovative applications of trenches technologies, as well as NPDES permit compliance. Mr. Leon is also participating in the development of the Buried Asset Management Institute International, also known as BAMI, Asset Management Certification Program. He currently serves as Vice Chair of the West National Collection System Committee, and he's a PACP trainer. He's also very recently certified to train the Inspector Training Certification Program, ITCP, for the inspection of cured-in-place pipes. Luis? Thank you, Ted. Thank you very much for that uh, great introduction, and good afternoon to everyone. We're going to be talking about the new PACP version 7.0. And, and what type of extensive review it went through. We'll talk some of the, about it, some of the technical updates that were made, some of the new items that were included also into the manual and the training <coughs> and the certification. And then we'll talk about the educational benefits, um, how the format also has been uh, changed a little bit or updated a little bit to make it more user friendly, and also about some of the new appendices that you'll be hearing about. The review team that was organized and put together to, to review PACP was a very large team. Of course, NASCO was heading the overall team. And we had people from the uh, Infrastructure Condition Assessment Committee, Software Vendors, Asset Management Committee, Manhole Rehabilitation Committee, and Lateral Committee. To this, we, uh, of course, added pipe manufacturers and contractors, consultants, um, municipalities, and suppliers. So it, it turned out to be a very large group that came to you know, many meetings and discussions and, and, and finally a consensus on what the uh, updates were going to be to 7.0. So there were over 60 collection system professionals that reviewed the entire manual and collectively raised the bar on, PA, on the PACP industry standards. This is really a, an unprecedented review of, of this document and this training program. And that's why you know, we feel very confident that it's going to be well accepted by uh, many, many, many of the users, or 100% you know, of the users. With respect to the technical updates, you know, it, it's the, the new manual, it, you're going to see that it's more user friendly and informative. It describes some of the new and supplemental technologies that are out there, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. And it also includes backgrounds to some of the technical issues, such as deterioration mechanisms, um, the stages of sewer collapse, and, and, and how the sewer collapse can happen. So you know, much better descriptions and discussions on that. Also, the technical form, uh, the header form, um, it's, it's more robust, more informative, 
there's no data loss at all from the uh, old 6.0.1 to the new version 7. There's also new um, 10 new custom fields that can be used for user-specific needs. We know that there's many municipalities uh, out there that would like to use their own custom fields, and this will give them the, uh, uh, the advantage to do that, and also allows for more information to exist on the existing database. There's also, uh, with respect to the header form, nine redefined fields and some of the new options. There's new material options, um, some of the weather conditions were updated and, and, and clarified also. And then we added a consequence of failure um, data field. And of course, you know, the data is now, or all of the data, the databases are going to be up, being updated by all the, the different vendors that sell the PACP certified software. There are also five new fields. You know, uh, for example, reviewed by and certificate number. This is to somebody else outside of um, the field crew is actually reviewing the data, and, and that person is is also PACP certified. Uh, new fields for coatings, vertical datum, lining methods, and the inspection technology used, whether it was CCTV uh, or something like the panorama or, or different types of new technologies that are out there. There are also additions uh, of modifiers to the infiltration codes. And this is to, to uh, show if the infiltration is happening at the barrel, uh, at a lateral, or a connection, or a joint, yeah, in order to clarify, better clarify where the infiltration is occurring so that you know, a manager can actually know where those points are if they want to decide to, to uh, apply certain technologies to stop infiltration. Also with respect to laterals, uh, and, and of course Lori will be talking more about MACP and LACP, but if someone is doing an inspe an MA, a PACP inspection, if any defect can be seen in a lateral, it is coded as defective. Um, and, and this is something that is going to be very helpful also in case of some of those municipalities that own a portion of the lateral, for example, or they're going to be able to make some decisions as to if they want to maintain or if they want to rehabilitate some of those lateral connections. The tap code modifiers were also prioritized, and additional observations can be included in the remarks, such as you know, tap defective or intruding or capped, um, active or abandoned. So those were more prioritized with respect to actual condition grades. Also, uh, in the dams and levees portion, you know, the, the U.S. Corps of Engineers um, actually adopted uh, PACP for their dams and levee inspections. So there were additional condition grades that were added for those inspections. Some of the new items, you know, of course, the, supplement, the new supplemental technologies or new technologies were added to the head of the form and to the database. Uh, if it, they were using laser profiling or laser dive measurement tools uh, or sonar in the case that the, you know, a, a user is trying to measure the quantity of sediment that is in a pipeline, um, sidewall scanning, uh, zoom camera technology. Uh, we know that some users, uh, some of the values may be using zoom cameras for some initial inspections. Um, and pipe penetrating radar, because you know, PPR is becoming more and more um, used out there when you're trying to locate not only uh, voids beyond the pipe to a certain extent. Again, in the, the header form, you know, the 10 optional custom fields, there's a total of 54 fields that also include quality control fields and GIS fields, so that now the database can be more complete and, and, and linkable to GIS um, in, in a municipality, for example. There's also redefined fields and new options, like I mentioned before, with regards to new materials and, and weather and consequence of failure. And of course, the consequence of failure would be used by you know, somebody, for example, in the engineering department. In the new fields, um, the, the ones that are important are reviewed by and review certificate number. And this refers to quality control. 
somebody who's executing quality control of those of those videos and the, and the data coding that was inputted by the uh, operators. There's also different coding methods, uh, the inspection technology used, northing and easting or Latin long, uh, pretty important that, that now can be added to the database. Um, actual elevation of the uh, you know, of the manhole or the ground a coordinate system because it could be a state plane or a different coordinate system in uh, the same with a vertical datum when it refers to you know 1929 or, or, or later datum and the accuracy of that GPS is it a handheld unit which is you know, going to give you plus or minus three to ten meters or is it something that is going to give you much better accuracy um, with regards to quality assurance also you know we have of course that so survey by and certificate number that, of course, a certified user must be present at the inspection site unless coding a pre-existing video. So this makes a differentiation between someone who's an operator in the field doing the coding or someone in the office doing the coding, the coding um, and also doing quality assurance. Uh, with respect to materials, you know, we um, asbestos cement and transite pipe were added and also ABS uh, pipe. There were also major changes in the structural defects, and, and we'll describe these a little bit more. The Buckland defects were moved to the deformed group. We also included the use of a small modifier for some of the joint codes for dams and levees, uh, because this is something that you know, they, they're using a lot in their inspections and in their coding systems. Also added new codes for surface damage. Um, now, in some of some of the lining feature defects, you know, it maps it maps them better with the new definitions. And there's other definition changes and explanations in the manual, and also more sample images. This is something that NASCO was working very hard at: is getting better quality sample images of uh, as many defects as possible, in order to make it um, easier for the operator to actually look at the manual and and, and see an image and make sure that it's what they're what they're coding. As I mentioned, the buckling uh, within the, was moved within the deformed group, and, and this is a, actually a, a great improvement because you know, people were were using it differently in, in, in different municipalities or different cases. So now that it's within the deformed group, it's going to give give us better access to looking at all the deformations in the various types of pipes and various types of linings. With respect to the dams and levees, like, uh, like I said, there's now uh, a small modifier for the joint codes. They, they have a small offset if it's up to one pipe wall thickness. Uh, there's also small separated joints or small angular joints that are less than 5%. There's new codes for surface damage with respect to surface spalling of the coating. Um, now, it's, you know, if the coating is damaged or splintered off, then you can code that. Um, and in the lining features, you know, the, the, some of them were mapped, the buckle lining, the bulges were mapped to deformations, and the pinholes were mapped to the infiltration stains so that you know, they're better um, grouped into the various defect codes. Also, when uh, someone is using sonar for accurate measurement of deposits, you know, for example, you know, that the amount can be recorded as a percentage of the original diameter or a dimension in the value percentage column up to three decimal points. So you know, we know that there are uh, sonar equipment out there and, and, and programs that can give you fairly accurate uh, estimations uh, of, of how much sediment on how, or how much deposits there are in a, in a pipe, especially in large diameter pipes that are flowing fairly full. So that was added to PACP. Um, we talked a little bit about the new modifiers for infiltration, you know, various types of infiltration, whether it's stain, weeper, dripper, runner, or gusher. Now those modifiers can will tell us if the infiltration runner, for example, is at the barrel or at a lateral or a connection or a joint. They're defining those. 
Uh, cross bores have been a, a major issue in the last few years. So there was a, no, a sentence added that cross, cross bores in three and two sewer lines pose significant hazards and that PACP users and, and operators should report when they encounter cross bores to the appropriate authorities, um, you know, especially if they see a pipe that could be a gas pipeline. Can you imagine the consequences of that? Also, in the, the TAP modifiers were, were reordered and in the order of priority, uh, especially when one, one, the more, more than one modifier can be used. So you know, we have a, a TAP defective or intruding TAP activity or abandoned uh, in an order of priority. And then a TAP can, is defective when any defect can be seen inside the lateral. So again, this is something that would also alert uh, the client or the, the municipality uh, or the operator that a TAP is defective, even if they don't have a lateral assessment program. With respect to access points, when there's other special chambers, uh, it's not other special structure. That can be an access structure that is not described elsewhere. You know, and an example is an open cut access point to the pipe. Sometimes this may be necessary, and, and, and they may leave it open that way, or just covered somehow. Catch basin uh, was redefined also as an inlet or an access structure. Um, other access points and miscellaneous features and the pipe. Uh, you know, we've all seen some of these where the pipe ends underground without a manhole. Um, that was also included. And lining change. Now it allows you to record, record coating changes. Sometimes you'll encounter a pipe that was probably coated with a cementitious coating, and then uh, it was rehabilitated to a certain extent, also with a CITP, for example, a curing place pipe. So those can be coated separately. There are many educational benefits now uh, to the new program also. The new training material will follow the manual much better. Yeah, it, it'll be a lot easier to, for us trainers and also for the trainees to, to go through the training and follow the manual during the training material. Um, yeah, major clarification rules for continuous defects is also now in the, in the manual with a, a very detailed example. It provide, this example provides a, a very clear ex example for overlapping continuous defects that you know, it really improves and, and it will improve the more accurate coding by the operators. We talked about the buckling code, moved into the, uh, the form modifier, then the, the new codes for surface damage also, if the surface is falling off the coating or corrosion and tuberculation, when you start looking at you know, inspection of some force mains, for example, or some um, even gravity lines that are you know, metallic pipes. Um, also, Laurie and Jim are going to talk more about the, the new appendices, uh, especially, especially Jim. And the new appendices actually have been improved dramatically to help the field personnel identify many things, such as pipe materials and other things. The format of the manual is more user-friendly. The new color code charts for header codes uh, facil will facilitate populating the fields. There's a new manhole measure diagram that uh, Lori will talk about that will eliminate second guessing about what components of the manhole are being measured, for example. Jim will also be talking about the risk management appendix. appendix. Uh, and this is brand new. And this, this, this relates more to a little bit more into asset management and, and, and risk management and defining what the li likelihood of failure is and the consequence, consequence of failure and how we can define risk for a pipeline. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to turn it over to Ted again. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Um, we want to take a few minutes now to take some of the questions. We've, we've uh, had a lot of questions come in, um, and we're trying to kind of work through all of them. One of the kind of continuous questions that we keep getting is, are, are the slides available? Um, and they will be available on www.wef.org slash PACP, and there'll be a link um, to that in, to, be, uh, to be able to get to that. Um, but another thing is that actual recordings of this webinar are going to be avail available on both the WEF and the NASCO website. So 
the web.org and nasco.org. Um, you should be able to get recordings of this uh, of this uh, webinar. Um, one of the questions, um, and I'm, I'm going to hit on some of these questions. Uh, someone says they're due to recertify before May and should wait. And there was some related questions about is version 7.0 available to certified users of 6.0. Um, try to answer the first question. When um, your certification is good for three years, and when that three years expires, uh, you're no longer certified, but you still have a one-year grace period when you can recertify rather than go through the, the initial certification procedure. Uh, one of the things about that is if, if you're an operator, that could be an issue because you're, you're truly not certified during that year. Um, if you do get, as part of either a certification or a recertification, if you're certified or recertified uh, beginning January 1st of this year, 2015, you'll qualify for to get an unbound manual of 7.0. Uh, it's for $10, basically, the cost of shipping. Um, for a manual, it's going to be unbound, so you'll need to, to put it in, uh, either replace it, your existing manual, or get a new binder for it. But again, that's going to be available, and we'll be, we'll be making those notifications through the contact information that we get uh, for people taking the classes since January 1st. So you want to make a note of that. Um, and then, you know, the other question was, is version 7.0 available to those certified in 6.0? And in addition to the offer for the manual, um, PACP recertification, again, which happens every three years, will incorporate the 7.0 changes, but NASCO does plan to provide uh, 7.0 training for PACP users on our website. So as we develop all the training materials for the new uh, version, that should be available. Um, we're going to make some of that available on the website, uh, so that all follows. Um, let me, let me uh, go through some of the other questions. Uh, there was a question, and, and um, maybe uh, Luis, uh, I can address this to you. Are there any considerations for coding of force mains? Well, there, there has been a little bit now, but um, the, the pressure pipe committee is actually looking into developing more codes for force main inspections. And um, as we all know, a lot of the defects that, uh, that are found in some force mains, if they're emptied and, and they can be CTTV'd, uh, are pretty similar to some of the ones that we see on other pipes. So, um, but as far as I know, the, pipe, uh, the pressure pipe committee is working uh, very hard at determining if, what else is needed. At the same time, also AWWA has a committee that is looking into um, coding and prioritization of water lines. So we hope that uh, we'll be working together in order to come up with a better standard for that. Kat, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, well, yeah, just to add to that, if you, uh, on the NASCO website, if you go into the specification section of the website, the uh, Pressure Pipe Committee actually did put together a force main inspection technology summary. And they've been, they have been working on in that summary, they identify the different inspection technologies that are available and provide a good uh, uh, kind of matrix on how to use that. But uh, like Louis said, they are looking at you know the coding and how that can apply. Obviously, it's very difficult um, for that to apply from a visual perspective in, in force mains. But again, um, they're looking at that as well as you know pressure pipes being being potable water pipes too. Um, Question was um, trying to. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep track of all the questions. Um, the uh, when will uh, training for um, actually when will the train? The question was when will the training be available for 7.0, and when will training for trainers be available um, for 7.0? We we plan on training trainers really next month in April as we get closer to getting the, um, all the training materials. We're finalizing things on the manual, getting the training materials finalized. As we get those things finalized, we do plan towards the end of April to start training trainers. Um, 
with, with the training materials. What's important is to make sure that the trainers have, um, you know, are familiar with all of the training materials that are out there. Um, Luis, I'll, I'll direct this one to you also. Has NASCO taken in any consideration into exfiltration with contaminating groundwater? And, and maybe um, Gina can touch on that too. Boy, with respect to exfiltration, that's that's something that uh, you know can be very hard to measure, of course. But and, and depending on what type of defect uh, you have and where it's located, um, if I remember correctly, some of the coating has been, or some of the grading has been changed uh, re with regards to the location of some of the defects, Ted. Um, but with regards to measurement of exfiltration, that is something that uh, at this point with the ICP cannot be done. And, and there are some technologies out there that um, claim that they can potentially do it. But uh, you know, it could be one of the uh, one of the ten additional user fields used for that. I can uh, add that there's two sort of different programs the EPA addresses and the states address stormwater and sanitary sewer wastewater differently. So there are instances where exfiltration from wastewater pipes has gotten into the um, supporting materials. You know, sometimes the trenches are you know, have a sub-drain with gravel, and the wastewater has flowed through that and resulted in contamination, which has been addressed with enforcement action. Similarly, I believe there's at least one case where somehow that got into the storm drain system. And there, and so the they are, I know at least one case in New England where they're lining because of that because of the uh, wastewater getting into the stormwater or uh, clean water, like a stream or something where the outfall is. OK. Um, next question, and again, I'm going to direct this one to Luis. What's the distinction between a connection and a lateral? Well, the, the lateral itself is after the connection point uh, to the main. So. In some instances, when the operator pans the camera and tells right and view, you know, views right into the lateral, the defect could be right at the connection point between the lateral and the main, or beyond that point, and that that's where we make the decision. Yeah, that's that's what I've always trained that the connection is actually that point between the you know that interface between the actual lateral pipe and the main pipe. Um, Couple of, again, kind of I'm going to say administrative kind of kind of questions, but will recertification be available online anytime soon? Um, as many of you know, we had to take recertification off um, because again, the recertification is geared to version 6.0. So beginning January 1st of this year, we actually uh, removed, you know, took the online course offline. Uh, once we get those materials developed, again, we're still we're finalizing the manual. We're, we're still finalizing the materials. Once we get all those materials developed, specifically the recertification materials developed, we'll be in a better position to, to actually put them on to you know, develop the online modules that we had uh, before. Um, another question was, that, does this webcast count? Uh, and the, the, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I think what you're asking is, does the webcast count towards, I guess, recertification? This webcast is really just informational. Uh, the recertification program, um, you know, there's a spe specific program for that, that that we work with at NASCO and all of our trainers. Um, another question was how many trainers we have, and I believe it's right around 120 uh, PACP trainers. Um, now, again, we're getting a lot of these uh, um, Questions. Just give me a second to go through them. Um, when will the software companies have their updates? Um, and I can go ahead and, and uh, kind of hit that one too. Software companies have been, and I didn't mention this before, but they've been working very closely with us 
um, on all of those webinars that we mentioned. Um, they've, been, they've been pretty much there every step of the way. Uh, the main purpose is to make sure that all of the data gathered in the current version of PACP and MACP and LACP transfer seamlessly to the next version. Um, with the manuals and the information that they have right now, and once we're complete with the manual, we'll get that to them also, but we've given them information all along. They are currently, I'm talking about really the software committee from NASCO that's made up of the software vendors. They are currently um, um, developing that data dictionary. So once that data dictionary is developed, then the software vendors will actually start updating their software. Similar to what happened with version 6.0 back in 2010, we expect about a three to six month lag time from the time we get version 7.0 out till the time that the version 7.0 software is available. Again, that really depends on you know, how, how the market is for the actual uh, software vendors and whatnot. Um, so there, there were some various questions about contacting your software vendors, and again, look look for those updates to become available probably about three to six months after the after we actually convert to version 7.0. Um, I guess I, I can direct this one to Luis also. Are there levels for coding H2S corrosion with respect to surface erosion on concrete pipe? Luis? Boy, that one I'll, I'll have to investigate and probably get back to the uh, the person who has a question, but I don't remember that it, there are different levels. Uh, Ted, do you? Well, I don't think that part's actually changed. Um, yeah, that part didn't change. Yeah, the, the, the different types of surface damage um, are really, really the same. There's some, some more clarifications and provided better, better photographs, um, but we really don't have any change with respect to the, those, those codes. Um, I will say they're very important codes. You know, if, if any codes are, are uh, misinterpreted more, it's probably those codes. So, but those codes really have not changed. We did have um, kind of a typo is what I'll call it in the actual uh, condition grades for those codes. They have been re-looked at and, and verified. Um, yeah, so the, the, grades, the grades were revised for those different codes. That's what I remember. Right. Um, here's another question, I guess, for you. Uh, Louise, is dirt, and I should say soil, in a, in a lateral considered as a defect? Soil in a lateral? If it can be seen, again, it needs to be, it needs to be coated uh, by just being a, you know, some, type of, some type of obstruction or, or sediment. But that's only if you can be seen from the main. Right. And, and um, what the best practice on that is we, if we call a lateral defective, or I should say a tap, if we call a tap defective, um, we should really, in the remarks of that uh, code, code exactly what we're seeing up the lateral. Now, if part of that defect goes into the main line that we're coding, the main pipeline, Obviously, it becomes another code with the PACP uh, system. Um, and Ted, if I could add, I guess if we're concerned about calling it defective because we don't know where that soil is coming from, this would be another great place to use the miscellaneous general observation code and, again, put yes. something in the remarks column. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and. Uh, Actually, we're just talking about this. I just, this, this one just came in. Um, we, will coding defective laterals in PACP in version 7 affect the grading uh, the main line receives? Now, you know, we, again, we went through and then talked about, uh, I believe, condition grading. Um, it, will, it will not unless those codes actually apply to the main line. So the purpose of being able to now, which is, again, like Luis said, is new, code the defects within a lateral is to be able to kind of sort through and find laterals where there are defects in them. But if those defects do not come out into the main pipeline, 
then they aren't part of the PACP inspection and therefore don't get condition grade. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and we're going to have another time for uh, questions um, at the end of this webcast. But let's go ahead and, and uh, move forward. Our next presenter, <coughs> excuse me, our next presenter will be Laurie Perkins. Laurie is a senior project manager in the wastewater practice group at Wright Pierce in New England. She has over 20 years of extensive experience with pipeline assessment, flow monitoring, and I and I studies, sewer system evaluation surveys, SSES work, and pipeline rehabilitation projects. Her civil engineering and project management experience involves drainage and sewerage collection systems, force mains, and CSO and SSO abatement. Laurie is also a certified NASCO trainer for PACP, MACP, and LACP. Laurie? Thank you, Ted. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to speak specifically on some of the updates to the manhole assessment and certification program as well as the lateral assessment and certification program. Um, the MACP and LACP programs were first published in 2006 for manholes and in 2010 for laterals, so they're fairly newer. These updates that are coming out in May to be released will be the first updates to both these programs. And in general, we have added functionality to these programs while still keeping the program simple. Similar to the reasons for the updates for PACP, we needed to also update manhole, the manhole and lateral assessment program because we have new data users. For example, departments of transportation, um, people that are more using the program for evaluating storm conditions, storm type condition, and as well as the Army Corps of Engineers specifically using the program to assess their levies. So we have different types of structures that we can now address with the uh, program, and we can now take precise measurements that are needed relative to those new structures. This also created an additional need for QAQC measures, and those have been adapted into the program. And now we will have something we never had before, and that's manhole condition grade, so we can calculate overall condition ratings for our structures using the MACP program. With the addition of new technologies, like the manhole zoom cameras and manhole 360, um, there was an additional need to modify the program accordingly to adapt to these types of technologies. We've developed new and better schematics throughout the manhole assessment certification program uh, manual. This is just one of those um, programs. And now we will have um, actually have this schematic on the color-coded chart, which many of you are probably familiar with and keep in your back pocket, uh, that have all the available codes from PACP. That color-coded chart is going to be expanded to include some of the very specific manhole types um, codes. For example, coding something on the cones interior COI versus the wall exterior um, would have the code WE. Those are all going to show up on our new color-coded chart. We've always had the two different types of inspections, the level one inspection versus a level two inspection. And by definition, a level one inspection would just be done topside or from the surface where you would not be entering the manhole and you would not be using any specialized equipment. Uh, for the level one inspection, the previous program um, had several, several mandatory fields. We've actually gone back through and have reduced the number of mandatory fields significantly, significantly. again, to make the program um, a little more simple but still add the value that we need in doing a level one inspection. We can also use the inspection details form. This is the third form in the manhole assessment certification program where you actually typically in a level two start coding defects, again, for wall interior versus wall exterior. But you'll now have the ability to access that form simply to notate a hole, for example, something significant if you're only doing a level one inspection. And then we've also add, added fields for component conditions. Um, to just identify the overall condition of each component. 
and just to differentiate between the two inspections, a level two inspection would still include, uh, would still be defined as a detailed condition assessment where we're using specialized equipment to see every part of the manhole or we're doing manhole entry in order to code every defect that we can find. Some changes to the header section. Uh, first of all, the fields are going to be much more consistent with those in the PACP header form. For example, drainage area is now uh, on both forms and before it was not. This is just an example of the new MACP inspection header form. You can see that we now have um, the number of the field is the first digit you actually see, and then the, uh, the field name followed by, in parentheses, whether it is mandatory for a uh, level one inspection, a level two inspection, or for both. We've also modified the weather condition options in the manhole inspection certification program. Um, we always had uh, saturated with option five, six was damp. We've eliminated both of those and we have uh, five being that it's dry weather on the day of the inspection, but it, uh, the ground is actually wet. So it takes into consideration that uh, preceding rain event. Also in the header section, we've made a modification to pre-cleaning. Um, we had heavy cleaning with H. We used to have J for jetting. Now we have L for light cleaning or jetting using a power wash, power washing technology with no entry required. Inspection status we always had in the manhole assessment certification program. This is when we try to document why we could not do the inspection, if we could not do the inspection. For example, the manhole would be unable to open, meaning we were able to locate it but not able to open it or it was unable because it was locked or stuck for some reason versus unable to access. Um, could be that we found the manhole, but there's actually a car parked over it, so we couldn't access it. Buried, if the manhole was uh, buried and we could not get into it to do the inspection. Surcharge, the manhole does not exist. In other words, we uh, know that it's not still on a GIS map, but we have done field work to confirm that it actually does not exist. All those options are there. And they have now been copied to the PACP program because we want to be able to track why we couldn't finish a pipeline inspection, just like we wanted to track why we couldn't finish a manhole inspection. Uh, typically, we get a report from our CCTV contractors that would include all of the footage that they were able to complete with only uh, possibly some notes being submitted by the CCTV contractor to explain why they couldn't complete the total footage assigned, for example. With this option, it's going to allow the contractors to fully document why certain lines were unable to be inspected. Also, uh, for manhole use, again, to uh, reflect the needs of the Army Corps of Engineers, we've added codes for dams and levees. We've added a measurement for the rim to grade exposed, which is where we're going to enter the depth between the rim of the manhole and the grade level of the lowest exposed point of the manhole. So we can actually uh, estimate and understand the amount of that, uh, the amount of exposure that that manhole has. We've added um, a field in the component observation form for frame clear opening width. It was just uh, left out of the initial program. We've added a cover shape for manhole cover, covers that are indeed triangle shaped. Um, we've added the option to select that the cone is actually not present. That was also not an option in the initial program, and now it is, for cases where we truly do not have a cone present uh, in the manhole structure. We've also added schematics for pipe connections to better explain how the numbering of pipe connections occurs in terms of lining up our outgoing pipe at the 6 o'clock and calling that pipe number one. Um, we've always been asked for examples. Uh, we typically train them in class, but now they would be in the manual when you have two outgoing um, pipes, for example, and how to number the second outgoing pipe if the first one's numbered one at 6 o'clock. In the component observation section also, we have mapped transit. We've removed transite, and we've mapped it to asbestos cement pipe. So there's only one option there. Uh, under special condition, we've uh, 
renamed that field type type. <laughs> and uh, that in the manual section form, if you recall, uh, describes what kind of pipe connection we have, whether it's a force main coming into our manual, if it's a drop pipe inside or outside, or if it's a re regular gravity connection. Uh, the field name used to always be called special condition. We've just renamed that to um, call it pipe type. And in that same section, the option for gravity relief sewer has been modified to be more clearly called just a gravity connection coming into a manhole. We've uh, changed or uh, defined better the definition of channel exposure. We used to have a percentage as to whether the manhole uh, channel was partially open uh, by more than 50% or less than 50%. We've actually removed that percentage altogether, and your channel exposure is either going to be defined as partially open, fully open, or fully closed, regardless of the percentage. Uh, and we've added options for manholes with no bench or uh, manholes with no channels. We've, uh, just like Louisa had explained about the pipeline assessment program, throughout the manual you will see better images and schematics like this one of the channel and joint uh, definition throughout the manual. And in regard to the schematic here, we have uh, clarified that, and this came out in a technical memorandum previously, but this, the new manual have this schematic right in it, but the interface between the manhole wall and the bench is the bench wall, uh, is, is a bench joint, okay? And the interface between the uh, bench and the channel is going to be called a channel joint. The interface between the pipe joint and the channel is also a channel joint. So defects associated with those interfaces would have a J in the joint column to indicate that it's associated with a joint. We have um, some redefined fields and new fields specifically for coding methods of, of manholes or other structures. PU is going to be the code for polyurea, CT, coal tar, CM, cement mortar, XX, not known, and then ZZ for other. And uh, Jim is going to spend quite a bit of time regarding the new appendix that includes a risk management uh, module. So we have added for manholes as well the consequence of failure um, call, uh, code in column to calculate now both consequence of failure of our structures, manholes, and other access type points. And um, we've always been addressing condition or uh, likelihood of failure of our manhole structures. We touched on these earlier. I'm just going to uh, repeat them, but the other special chamber has been changed to other special structure. And again, even though the manhole assessment and certification program is titled manhole, we're talking about any structure that we could actually do a condition assessment on. So other special stru structure could include um, any access structure not described elsewhere by our access point codes. Uh, for example, an open cut access point over the top of the pipe. The catch basin uh, ACB code, again, is an inlet or an access structure <laughs> that's available in the program to inspect catch basins on our storm sewer systems or our combined sewer system. Then end of pipe, better defined uh, as where the pipe ends underground without a manhole, could be the upper reach of a small section of gravity sewer, for example, without daylight from a manhole, for example, to the surface. Then we have the option of miscellaneous um, lining change specific for manholes that may have been rehabilitated with different lining products or coatings. We would use the code MLC uh, to identify those changes. Again, similar to PACP, um, we will differentiate the condition grades that are now available in this new program between structural condition grades and O&M type condition grades. And the condition grades for manholes or other structures are going to be divided by component in the matrix uh, in the appendix for condition grades, condition grades for structures. So by component, you'll have grades for chimney, cone, wall, bench, or chan channel. And in a lot of cases, those will be the same. Um, but in special cases where it makes sense, the condition grades will be elevated uh, depending on the type of defect that we're talking about in a structure and where it's located. 
Just uh, moving on to the lateral assessment and certification program changes, we have um, new codes here as well for when we come across backflow preventers, the new code will be ABP. Uh, if we want to identify or observe that there's a roof vent, we have the new code ARV. And then for lateral traps, we have the new code ALT. Also, in terms of the program changes, uh, we've made the changes in order to address some of the newer technologies available for doing lateral inspections. And we have actually described those new technologies in the new manual. Uh, for example, the CCTV lateral launcher will be described as a technology for lateral inspections in the new manual. For pre-cleaning specific to laterals, we've added the code R for rotting. And again, better images and schematics are now going to be available um, uh, throughout the manual and in the training materials. We had a lot of those comments, and we have certainly addressed those with the new program. So again, I just would like to say that you know, with the changes that have been made specifically for manholes and laterals, and I know with the pipeline program as well, uh, we have significantly increased functionality, but have been able to keep the program uh, simple. And with that, I will turn it back over to uh, Ted. Yeah, thanks, Laurie. Um, I want to take a little bit of time right now, because we've been getting actually a lot of questions coming in. Um, so if I can just take a few minutes before we start with Jim and take a few questions. And Laurie, um, some of these are really directed towards the manholes. And one of the questions, is there an official code for a drop connection uh, or are we still using an MGO? Uh, the drop connection would be coded in a structure by w when you're doing the pipe connection. Um, so you have identified a drop connection in the pipe connection field, which are, I think, 91 to 102 in the program now, the field numbers. So in there, you would enter the pipe type being a, a drop connection. And you're going to actually document both the upper invert elevation and the lower elevation of that drop type connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure if this, uh, this may have been a holdover from PACP too, but the actual drop connection within the pipeline in PACP, um, we, w there was a bulletin that was put out a couple years ago actually to code them as taps at 6 o'clock. And tap code was actually written so that, you know, you could, you could actually use that code within the pipeline. So um, I had a comment. I don't think it was a question, but the manhole schematic doesn't include adjustment rings. There's actually, I, in the industry, there's actually two kind of definition of what those adjustment rings are. Uh, one that we call out in the manual, the actual adjustment rings fit on top of the frame. Generally, they're used uh, in like paving projects when you have to um, increase the elevation of the frame by like an inch or two. You put these on top of the frame. Uh, that's one adjustment ring. The other people call, um, you know, the, the concrete and also made of other types of materials that are used to create the chimney as adjustment rings also. So I'm not sure um, what the question is asking, but the adjustment rings really are uh, addressed within, you know, with, within the actual, within the manual and within the actual um, um, uh, component form. Um, yes, we actually we actually also Ted have the you know adjustment ring height field in the manhole component observation form, so you can you know explain by height taking the measurement from the rim down to the bottom of any adjustment rings that distance in terms of depth. There's mm -hmm. a field for that right now to to handle adjustment rings. Okay. Next question had had actually to do more with the data uh, with the data and the databases. Uh, has it been thought put into how old defect data will be merged with new data uh, in asset databases? Aside from new codes, will existing code scores change? Um, I, and again, like I mentioned, uh, there were representatives from the software committee, and particularly software vendors, that were a part of um, all of these changes. And one of their main focuses was to be able to map all of our you know, all of the existing data into the new data. So yes, that's, um, that has been taken into consideration. Um, interesting question here. Will manhole cover shape choices include hexagonal? 
Are you passing that to me? Sure. <laughs> well, it doesn't right now. I guess it would be up to the team. Uh, I, I guess you know we need to determine just like anything else how frequently we're frequently we're seeing that, and then uh, you know it'd be up to the team that's doing the updates to see if that's something you guys want added, to. But it's not in there now. That's the answer on my end. Right. Right. Yeah. And. It basically it's another, and we did look at a lot of different shapes throughout this whole process, and some did get added. But in general, if it wasn't something that we normally saw, then it was uh, it was an other. Um, okay, let me. Uh, this is another question uh, for for you, um, Flurry. Uh, is there is there any coding to differentiate channel and pipe joints for different types of pipes such as concrete and plastics? Um, in the manual inspection program to address the different pipe materials, you would use the MMC code, and then if there are defects associated with those materials in the channel and we're defining the channel joint, the actual joint between then the interface between the concrete pipe and a plastic pipe would be considered a joint, then we're just, uh, the, you know, the rule is you call that a joint, you put a J in the joint column if there's defects associated with it. Of course, you're going to have photos attached to it, um, but if I'm understanding the question correctly, you know, you can designate the difference in materials in the channel using the MMC code when you get down to the channel and you're coding any defects associated with it. You use the MMC code and, and identify the second, you know, the change in material. Um, and then if it involves the joint, it would be the joint in the channel, the interface between that concrete and PVC pipe. Hopefully that answers that person's question. Okay. Um. Another question, will the new MACP rate the entire manhole or just the components or both? It, uh, similar to PECP, so it will um, rate the components. Uh, and then you'll get an overall rating for structural and an overall rating for O&M based on the entire manhole structure for an overall condition rating of that structure. OK. Um, Next question. We're getting a lot of questions right now, so they're they're kind of popping up pretty quick. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 correct. Um, did did you provide for coating lift holes in the pipes? Uh, I'll just comment on that. Lift holes are generally small holes that are used ba basically for lifting and placing, you know, heavy like concrete pipe uh, into a trench. Um, and basically, a lift hole is really a hole. Usually it has only one clock position, so there's no specific code. Uh, and usually it's at 12 o'clock, because if you think about it, that's, you know, when they're lowering it down in the manhole, that's where it ends up. So there's no specific code uh, for a lift holes. Another question, are there definitions of heavy cleaning and light cleaning? Uh, the same for MACP and PACP. Do you want to address that a little bit, Laurie? Um, the definition between, you know, heavy and light cleaning would still follow the, um, you know, CCTV guidelines that we have out, um, the, the guidelines for doing the work. Um, between that and manholes and laterals, no. I mean, we're talking, heavy cleaning is the removal of debris. Generally speaking, that's, that's the definition that gets you past light cleaning. You're actually removing some, some weight of debris. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah, the, the guidelines that we have, we have specification guidelines, NASCO does on the website, and they specifically uh, address different types of cleaning requirements. We actually incorporated that in a PACP. Manholes are still kind of, kind of different. You either need to, uh, can, can jet it out or, you know, with a high pressure or actually need to do an entry to, to cut things out. Uh, does a level two manhole inspection allow for camera tools to be used in lieu of a manhole entry? Yes, um, if I didn't say that clear enough, but a level two inspection is manhole entry or specialized equipment, something like a pole camera. And the idea of using equipment from the surface means that you should be able to see all the way down to your pipe, 
you know, and into your pipes, looking at pipe seals because the pipe seal condition and any um, defects around that are part of the the manhole inspection. So yes, level two includes both entry or specialized equipment that you that allows you to get down all the way to the bottom of the manhole to see everything. Mm -hmm. And and just to kind of make sure we're we're complete. Um, there are specifications out there that require an entry. Um, so PACP, we would call a level two inspection, you know, you would have that option unless it's written in the spec that you actually need to do the entry. Um, I have a question, still not clear on what to call a drop connection. Um, they said to call it a, a tap at six o'clock. Um, is that still the standard? Again, for a drop no. connection, again, now we're in the PACP, a pipeline, and I, I'm, I apologize for going back and forth in the PACP and MACP, but when a drop connection in PACP is still called a tap at 6 o'clock, usually, you know, it should be at the 6 o'clock position. Um, so that, that's what it is. Um, that, that's what we call that drop connection. And, and just so you know, that drop connection is that connection Usually, it's something you're going to see in an outside drop. You're not necessarily going to get to it in the inside drop. But in an outside drop, you're going to see that. And it's, it's basically going to be a pipe at 12 o'clock, whether it's a T or it could be a Y connection or whatever. So, um, OK, let me just go through um, some of these. Actually, I'm gonna let's let's go ahead and and, and move on now. Um, trying to read through all, all the questions, but uh, let's go ahead and move on. Our next um, speaker, and we have been getting actually quite a few questions about asset management, um, and that's actually very timely now because our next presenter is Jim Harris, uh, and and one of the appendices he's going to talk about is going to talk about um, some of the guidelines we provide in the new manual for asset management. Uh, Jim's a professional engineer with nearly 40 years of experience in sanitary sewer condition assessment and engineering. <coughs> Excuse me. He's worked in several sewer service companies, municipal utilities, and as a consultant. He's currently the owner of Harris Analysis in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, a company specializing in data analysis and asset management. He served on the NASCO Board of Directors in 2008 and 2009, and he currently serves on the board of the Buried Asset Management Institute International, BAMI, and he's a PACP certified trainer and analyst. Jim? Hey, thank you, Ted. Okay, we're now going to discuss very briefly several updates and additions to the appendices, but we're going to spend a bit more time with those that are new, and we're going to spend a lot more time with the new Appendix D that has been referred to the Risk Management Appendix that deals with asset management. As we've already discussed, each of these appendices has been thoroughly vetted and peer-reviewed, and all of them benefit from this. The first appendix is Appendix A, Codes List. Very little changes have been made to this appendix. The biggest one is that it now includes a section for LACP codes. You know, particularly those codes, unless you're a plumber, you don't know a whole lot about the access points and fittings that are different for service laterals than any other thing that we do. The color coded chart already has been referred to. One of our favorite charts has now been upgraded to the status of appendix. It is now appendix B. You know, this is a quick reference guide for the use of the codes. The biggest change to this is that it now includes a header info section, and it contains a diagram you see right here that illustrates how to make these measurements that can be confusing, such as the rim to invert measurement, the rim to grade measurement, and the grade to invert measurement. Appendix C, the PACP condition grading system, has been significantly upgraded uh, in, in, in several ways. Uh, this page here shows how examples are included in this appendix now. Uh, examples of how to compute continuous defects, how to compute segment grade scores, overall pipe ratings, the pipe rating index, and the quit grade. 
you know, here we see a very helpful chart that illustrates how all of these are done, ultimately getting to a quick rating that is going to be used in the asset management plan that we'll discuss later. This appendix now includes MACP discussion. Uh, almost identical, I think maybe actually identical to the PACP discussion. The, the only difference that I would point out is in the computation of continuous defects, in the PACP you divide the length of the continuous defect by five. Here in the MACP you divide it by one to get the equivalent defects. This appendix also uh, now combines storm and sanitary together for one rating, and has already been mentioned, it includes ratings for levees and dams. Uh, this recognizes the fact that levee and dam design, the pipes through them have significantly different loadings and purpose than for sanitary storm sewer, and through significant discussions with the Corps of Engineers, have, we have developed a rating system now for levees and dams. Finally, it includes a rating for MACP observations. And these ratings are summarized by the component, uh, chimney, cone and wall, bench and channel, and by traffic loading. And this takes into account that the, the relative elevation of the defect in the manhole, along with the loading, can significantly affect the, the damage there and there's the potential for more damage. So this is now taking into account that consideration. Now we come to the appendix that, uh, that I'm going to camp out at for a little while. Um, and the prime consideration here with Appendix D is to develop a risk management way to use, or actually use PACP data to develop a risk management plan that is used as an integral part of an asset management plan. You know, this explains how we can use simple but effective technologies involving PACP to determine risk management methodology. The definition of asset management I'll read to you here, but it's to maintain individual components or assets at the desired level of service at the lowest life cycle cost possible without negatively impacting performance of the overall system. Essentially what we're trying to do is, is to maintain the system in a proactive way instead of the reactive way that has been historically what we do. So how do we do this? Uh, asset management is essentially an organized way of answering basic questions, in this case of buried assets. These questions uh, include such as what types, materials, and laterals do we own? It, it's important that you know what you have, and this answers those questions. Where are these assets located? What are their materials, dimensions, depth, and ground cover? What is the condition of each asset? Which assets are critical to sustain performance? And what other community assets would be affected by failure of a particular asset? Th these questions I just read are substantially answered through the PACP process. But there are a few more questions that PACP data, not directly, but indirectly, is used to obtain the answers to these questions, such as, what are my best O&M and capital improvement investment strategies? What will be the rehabilitation cost? What effect will this have upon the utility budget? How should all of this be communicated to stakeholders? Now the focus of this discussion and this appendix is really how to answer those top questions there and using PAP data, PACP data to do this. And at the heart of this is risk management. Risk is the definition of a likelihood of failure and the condition of failure. So risk equals likelihood of failure times condition, consequence of failure. The likelihood of failure is directly obtained through the PACP data, through the condition scores. And we'll show you how to do that in a second. And the knowledge of the system then generates the consequence of failure. And risk is, like we said, a combination of those. Uh, basically, the consequence of failure is kind of the answer to this question. How bad is it if the asset fails? And we realize that all assets are not created equal. Uh, one thing I like to tell people is this. What asset or which asset would get you out of bed at night if you got the phone call? Uh, this question is answered. 
by this risk analysis. And consideration of the consequence of failure component of risk, it's important to consider more than the dollars that we normally like to run to. And we use here the triple bottom line approach that considers also the social and environmental cost of an asset failing. The economic consequences of these, I think we're familiar with this. Uh, what does it cost to repair the defect? You know, what property damage exists? What's the cost of the loss of production? But sometimes we forget the social and environmental consequences. Uh, the social consequences, how many affected properties are there? How many people are inconvenienced by this asset failure? What's the type of the affected properties? Uh, what's the duration of the failure? How does this affect loss of public image and safety concerns? And finally, uh, certainly with an EPA person present today, we've got to talk about environmental. But so often, uh, and we talked about exfiltration and overflows and so forth, the defect failure involves contamination of the soil, ground, and surface water. And it certainly can involve regulatory enforcement and fines. Now, this appendix also includes a considerable discussion. Uh, you can't go into a whole lot of detail in, in this format, but discussing how each consideration can be rated. And you have factors in a pipe, such as the pipe depth, the relative network position of the pipe, the diameter, the location, how close is it to a waterway, how close is it to a customer of high importance that would be affected by the failure, how accessible is this. And I think some of this is rather intuitive, but for example, the depth of the pipe. What we see here, if the depth is less than six feet, a consequence of failure, say, of one. But if the depth is greater than 24 feet, then it has a consequence of failure of six. Recognizing the deeper the pipe, the more flow is in the pipe, most likely, and, and the harder the rehabilitation project is going to be. Well, the same thing can be done with all the rest of these. Pipe diameter, the greater the diameter, the, the more the consequence of failure. How close are you to a customer, such as a school or a hospital or something of high importance? These all take into account and affect the consequence of failure. And finally, we come to a way to actually compute a number, in this case 4.03, that is the consequence of failure for a particular pipe. We summarize the economic problems, the social problems, the environmental problems. We can give a rating factor to these. In this case, this customer considered environmental twice as important as economic and social. We can look at the specific scores that are associated with each of these problems and come up with a code here, or rating for this, a 4.03 that can be combined with the likelihood of failure rating to actually produce a risk number. Once we know the risk number, we can uh, use a matrix such as this to determine, to guide us into what we're to do with that. We can look at, for example, the likelihood of failure. The, 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 the worse the defect is, we want to increase the aggressiveness of the rehabilitation. We can also look at the consequence of failure. The higher the consequence of failure, we want to increase the aggressiveness of the assessment. So if the, if the defect is a high likelihood, we want to get it fixed in a prioritized way. If it's a high consequence, we want to look at the system more open to find where, when those occur, and hopefully, as we've already said earlier in this presentation, to catch a problem before it gets bad. So if you have ultimately a combination of likelihood of failure and consequence of failure down here in the green area, you're probably not going to have a fairly an aggressive plan to work on that. But if it's up here in the red area, you're probably going to get a fairly significant uh, budget and schedule ready to take care of that. Here's how it actually all plays out uh, in, a, in a kind of a scene from a plan that I did a couple of years ago where we can list each pipe segment, the location of it, what, what, what type of highway and so forth it is. In this case, this pipe was put in the ground in 1921. It was rehabbed in 1980 for slip lining. Uh, so you got some information about this. And, and you, 
and go on to some of these others where you see here likelihood of failure 2.1, consequence of failure 2.5, giving us a risk of 5.3 here. We can look at uh, how often or what budget year such things could happen. In this case, we have a cured in place pipe that has some grease in it and an increased water level. We need to clean that line. You know, when should this occur? Well, given the risk number and how often we're out there doing maintenance on this pipe uh, to the consequence of failure, we can determine how often that line should be cleaned and how often this $440 cost will be incurred. The same with this pipe here, a vitrified clay pipe with fractures and cracks and, and a broken pipe void visible. Uh, that pipe is scheduled to be pipe burst at a cost of around $18,668. The, the risk will tell you when that thing needs to be done. So that's kind of the asset management portion of this. One more appendix, and then I want to talk about an initiative that NASCO is going to take on. But the, the final appendix is Appendix E, Pipe Shapes and Materials. And many of us are very experienced in this, that have been out the TV truck a lot and been around pipes all our lives. And, and, maybe wondering, well, this is pretty simple. Well, why study pipe shapes and materials in a course such as this? But we have to remember that not everyone who comes to training works in the field and is familiar with typical shapes and materials. Uh, I've been doing a lot of training, and I've never had a single class that somebody did not get confused on the test with the shape or the material. So NASCO has now developed an appendix that lists each shape and shows that. So we can talk about these and help people with the shapes they're unfamiliar with. Certainly the oval and egg-shaped pipe kind of confuses people sometimes. And then we look at pictures and explanations of each of the pipe types, the pipe materials, including the coating materials, that helps people at least see a pipe under pretty good condition. And then understanding, of course, when you got slime and poor lighting and so forth, this gets you to get more difficult, so all the more reason to have a conversation about this in the class. And finally, I want to consider a new initiative that NASCO has undertaken. It is called One Voice for Sewer Infrastructure. I think we're all familiar with the infrastructure report cards that are out there that say that our sewer is failing and, and all of that. And very likely, these things are true, but do we really know in a numerical way, in a verifiable way, how bad the sewers are in the country. So this initiative is hoping to discover to what extent do we really know the conditions of our sewers. We're going to collect, hopefully, a lot of PACP data from all over the nation, from various regions, various utilities, and so forth, and hope to come to this understanding. Uh, so how can a compilation of, of nationwide data assist us with this? We think it will. You know, are there differences regionally? Are there differences in, depending upon the size and the type of utility, the age of the pipe, materials in the pipe, and such? Then maybe most importantly, what can we learn regarding deterioration uh, by comparing older PACP inspections with newer PACP inspections for the same pipe? So NASCO is partnering with Oklahoma State University and various utilities and data providers around the nation is attempting through one voice to begin answering these questions. Uh, thank you for your consideration and time. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to actually go back to a question that was asked early on, and I put it on hold until now. Um, and there's a, we, we've been getting throughout this some asset management questions. But, uh, Jim, our asset, the question is, our asset management modules use a risk assessment, assessment of one to five for all of our infrastructure, can we easily convert the PACP risk scores of 1 to 6 to match our risk scores of 1 to 5? And theirs is based on WRC version 3, but it really can be based on any different type of scoring system. Can you speak to that a little bit, Jim? Yeah, it really doesn't matter what scoring system you use as long as it's a consistent scoring system you know, based upon you know, standardization like PACP is. Uh, we could use a 1 to 100 or 1 to 50 or anything. In this case, we looked at a, the 1 to 5 rating from PACP 
in using the quick rating, and I failed to talk about this during my discussion, so thank you for asking this. But during the quick rating, we have the maximum rating and the number of them. For example, if you have a maximum quick rating number of a five, meaning the worst rated observation of the type is a five, and there were three of those, it would be the number there be 5.3. But what if there were 10 of those? Then we recognize the fact that the more of this maximum rated defect in the pipe there are, it ought to be a slightly higher score. So if there's more than 10, then we just add one to that and make it six. We do the same thing whether the maximum rating was a four, like a four, three rating of four would give you a 4.3, but if you had 12, 13 ratings of four, that'd give you a five for that rating. So essentially, uh, PHCP is a good way to do it, but there are other ways out there. And as long as you're consistent and you get a grading score for your likelihood of failure from that, and then you use a consequence of failure number that balances with that so that those are equally weighted, that it would work. You don't want to have a, a, put a whole lot more emphasis on the condition than you do on the consequence or vice versa. Okay, a related question, because again, we're getting into a lot of uh, consequence of failure and likelihood of failure discussions. Um, are likelihood of failure and consequence of failure values calculated or estimated? Well, the likelihood of failure values are calculated, it, it, especially if you're using the PACP data. Uh, it comes directly from that and from the observations that the people in the field make when they're doing their inspection. Consequence of failure, honestly, is not quite as computed. Uh, the system that we've put into this does result in a computation, but, but it involves uh, sitting down with the utility and looking at maps and looking at where the relationship is to certain uh, other functions in their community, how close they are to the waterways, to the, the hospitals and so forth, you know, what the maximum diameter pipe do they have, you know, are they, are they under highways, are they under, uh, are they, how hard are they, is it to access and so forth. These are, it, it's honestly a little bit more of an art, but you do want to sit down within a particular project and have a consistent methodology for doing that. I wouldn't exactly call it a computation, but you can generate numbers from each of these areas that can then be put into a spreadsheet and a computation made to, to get a final number. Yeah, and, and uh, again, this is kind of a, a good question, a follow-up question. Am I understanding correctly that the camera operator will now be assessing the consequence of failure? And if so, shouldn't that assessment be made by the owner? Uh, no, the camera operator would not be making that assessment. Uh, some information that they're getting, such as what the cover is, you know, perhaps some of the stuff in the header, what the diameter is, uh, how deep the pipe is, and all that will help in that, but this is a, a an assessment made between an engineer or whoever's writing the asset management plan and the owner of the utility. Yeah, and that's 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 kind of important. What what we're providing is just uh, a methodology to actually use the uh, condition grades and the the coding that we use for PACP to help assign that. But again, yeah, we, we w would not expect the operator to actually do that or even know that information. Um, one of the questions, again, kind of a follow-up to that. Um, let me see if I can apologize. We, like I said, we do have a lot of questions. Um, but no, it's, it's not. We're not looking at the operator to actually actually provide that information. If I get get to that question again, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll I'll, I'll get that. I'm going to kind of go back through a lot of the questions that we've been up and um, getting on the screen um, and asking various uh, um, members of, that, of the presenters that have um, presented on those specific sections. And, and um, I'm going to call back on Laurie. Um, the manhole rating for both level one and level two or just for level two? Um, since the level, it's really for level two, that's where we start um, coding defects on that third form, the, the detail form. So the same um, codes that we had and the ratings that were applied to those from PACP would carry over. 
But that's not to say in level one, if you do an inspection and you use that third form just to identify a, you know, a couple different issues on the detail form like a whole, it's going to carry a, co a, a rating with it. But generally speaking, you're not doing your uh, defect identification and coding until a full level two inspection and using that third form. That's where all the ratings are going to come from, and, and that's where you're going to be able to get an overall condition rating. Yeah, and, and as I recall, one of the requests that really came through loud and clear um, and this came from people within our manhole rehabilitation uh, committee uh, and others was, can we have a um, is sound or defective for each component? Um, and we have provided that. So in a level one inspection where you're, you're really not gathering enough information to really put together a condition grade, you can Actually, and these are these are not mandatory fields; they're optional. But obviously, anybody can make an optional field mandatory within a specification. We, you know, we can have those fields filled in. Uh, and again, you know, that that was something so very easily you could at least see, you know, how the inspector looked at each one of the components as either sound or defective, and then write comments uh, based on what they saw. So while there's no condition grades for level one. There is kind of an easy way to see if we do see problems within level one. Uh, another question, again, this is kind of a, a mix, a mix and mixing things up a little bit, but uh, again, there was an, another question uh, about the difference between light and heavy cleaning, and I'm not sure uh, with it, which way you mean in a manhole or in a pipeline. In a pipeline, I got to encourage you to look at the the um, cleaning specification guidelines that NASCO put out. And by the way, all that stuff's free. So on NASCO.org, if you look up under the specifications, uh, there's actual specification guidelines that are actually very, very recent um, that were put out that split up the different types of cleaning, um, not just light and heavy, but really dependent on what types of things are in there. Within a manhole, it's really very simple. Uh, heavy cleaning means you need to do an entry to actually cut things out, whereas light cleaning means you can basically power wash it from the top of the manhole. Um, and that's, that's the only distinction there. Um, some more administrative stuff, and I, I'll cover some of that. Are MACP and LACP separate programs, or are they part of PACP in, in terms of certification and inspection? Uh, and again, MACP and LACP are all related, are both related to PACP in terms of the coding that's used. There's very few modifications, there are modifications, but very few um, that are different between MACP and LACP from PACP. And for that reason, the PACP training is required as a prerequisite to MACP and LACP. I'm going to move down a little bit in the um, uh, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually throw this on you, but I can comment on this, uh, on Jim. Um, will there be a course or a class for asset management? <laughs> I guess I would say I hope so, but uh, Ted, you're going to have to answer that question. <laughs> well, and there's, there are courses on asset management. In fact, in fact I mentioned BAMI twice. Oh, uh, both yeah. fall, fall Jim, there. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, well, no, no, both Jim and Luis are involved in that, that, that certification class. Uh, NASCO has been involved to some extent. Uh, we've also been involved in a certification class um, or program, I should say, under Virginia Tech. So there's a lot of those. Um, asset management classes. Now going to kind of the stickler question, will there be a specific module for the uh, um, appendix that Jim just, just uh, discussed? And yes, that is the plan. However, um, we don't plan on making that part of the PACP certification process. Obviously, um, that's kind of above and beyond what we need our operators to know. But we look to have that uh, that module available, you know, to provide for our trainers to be able to provide that training to people that want it, uh, and we'd like to have uh, an online module for that. So there's a lot of different um, kind of sources for asset management. 
and, and by the way, I mentioned those other two programs, as well as the EPA's program. Uh, you know, among others, we, we mentioned we, we spoke with Steve Albee in the development of this to make sh and work to make sure that what we were putting together would actually work with other types of asset management uh, programs. And, was, um, and, and we, that's kind of where we, where we ended up. Um, One other thing, Ted, if I may, uh, the, in the CTOWN programs that you referred to from BAMI, uh, we are in a, in a very significant way using PACP within that to explain how to determine the likelihood of failure. So uh, very much a cooperation there, and so there's not going to be any conflict between what one is saying and the other is saying about at least how do you use the PACP data. Right. Um, okay, again, another question. Will, will the appendix on asset management be within the training material in PACP? And again, um, I don't see how we can actually apply that to to users training in order to get their certification, but we will, we do have every intent uh, to have this, um, ha have that, uh, um, have a module specific for that, that appendix. Um, just going through again. Uh, oh, what, what is BAMI? Again, we mentioned that a few times, uh, and, and either Luis or, or Jim, can you, can you again kind of explain what BAMI is and B A M I I actually? Yeah, this is Jim. This is it's called the Barrett Asset Management Institute International. It really flowed out of uh, the, the, the large project that was done in Atlanta, Georgia, where Dr. Tom Isley worked with uh, the mayor and the people in Atlanta, and they saw the need of of setting up a an organization that's kind of above the fray to determine what, what are good procedures and so forth that can help utilities particularly learn how to do asset management and, and become more involved in that process. Louise, did you want to add anything else to that? No, that's, uh, that's a good description, Jim. Okay. Um, that's some uh, general uh, questions. When will the PACP training be offered? Uh, I mentioned before, some, someone asked how many trainers we have. There are, there's about, and, and I'm just, just estimating, about 120 PACP trainers. And, and out of them, most of those can train MACP and LACP. That was kind of a, an additional module. And, and I don't think there's many trainers that, that actually can't train MACP and LACP. That's the third day of the program, PACP being the first two days. On the NASCO website, if you get on, get on the, the home page and down towards the bottom, there's a PACP logo. You click on that, you'll be able to find our training calendars. What happens is those trainers put on training classes. We really don't control their classes. We have classes here in, in Marysville, just outside of Baltimore. Those classes, plus many of the other classes that trainers put together, are on those um, that calendar. So the first thing to do if you're looking for a PACP class is to look at the calendar that's on the website. Um, however, the other thing, if you don't see anything there that really uh, is convenient, contact NASCO and we will find PACP trainers in your area to find out, number one, if they already have any training planned that's not on the calendar because, like I said, not all of the training is on the calendar. Or they can set up a class depending on how many students uh, are available for you and in that specific uh, area. So we have ways of developing classes. Um, so if you need a PACP class, then really the best way to do is look at the calendar, but then if, uh, if you need to look further, see if there are any trainers in your area. Just a comment uh, on that, right around April, May, about the same time frame, we're actually looking at revising NASCO's website. And when we do, we're going to actually make that process easier to find either training in your area based on things like entering your area code or finding uh, trainers in your area to contact to see if they can conduct training and, and provide that training. So 
all that stuff should be uh, available relatively uh, in April, May timeframe, right about the same time we're putting out uh, 7.0. Um, the, the, there was a question. I'll be attending a PACP. Uh, sorry, I'll be attending a PACP class in May 2015. Will the 7.0 manual be available by then? Um, it should be. The class classes in May need to be uh, the version 7.0 class. So whoever's actually training that class will need to have been certified as a trainer in version 7.0. There's been a couple questions about actual trainers, so let me, let me talk about that too. One question is, how do I become a trainer? The way that you become a NASCO PACP trainer, uh, there's a, uh, you basically just, just contact NASCO, either at info at nasco.org uh, or one of the, the general um, emails. We can provide a, 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 a application. The process is that you submit an application and resume, there's an actual PACP trainer board, five individuals on that board that look at those applications and resumes. And, um, and that's basically how that whole process starts. So, um, and, and they go through the process of taking the test and then there's a classroom exercise in order uh, to become a trainer. So if you're interested, you know, by all means contact NASCO. Um, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank our sponsors in particular for making this webcast possible. Uh, your questions, we will plan on following up uh, the questions, but I want to take an opportunity to learn more about our sponsors. And our first is a strong NASCO and PACP supporter and a strong advocate for training in our industry. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dan Coley uh, from Jack DeHaney Companies. Dan? Hey, how's everybody doing? First off, I'd, uh, on behalf of everybody at the Jack O'Haney Companies, we would like to thank NASCO and the Water Environment Federation for the opportunity to sponsor such an important training program. The updating of the PACP program to version 7 represents an incredibly important tool for the wastewater industry. Um, Jack O'Haney Companies is the largest supplier of environmental cleaning and inspection equipment in North America. Um, the Jack Laney Company has the largest and newest rental fleet of equipment available. Uh, we have 18 locations throughout North America, and from those 18 locations, we service our customers and provide our rental equipment um, on a very short-term uh, notice. Currently, we've got uh, rental equipment working <coughs> in 46 of the 50 states and in almost every province in Canada. Um, our parts and service capabilities at these 18 locations is second to none. Our motto is uh, we service what we sell, we service what we rent. Our facilities are staffed with knowledgeable industry veterans and experts. We stock parts that you need, to, uh, all the parts that you need to keep your equipment on the job. Um, our training programs, as Ted said, it's, it's very, very important to us. Uh, our training programs range from PACP, MACP, and LACP programs that you've been listening to for the last two hours to operator and mechanic training programs for all of the products that we sell and rent. We have confined space fall protection and air monitoring programs, and we have the industry's only advanced pipe cleaning program. And the pictures that you're looking at right now, you're looking at on the left, you know, a, a fall protection training program that's done on our manhole simulator. So we're training people to properly uh, utilize the fall protection equipment. On the right-hand side, you're looking at our pipe cleaning proving grounds. Uh, the pipe cleaning proving grounds allows us to simulate a wide variety of common uh, pipe cleaning problems, as well as graphically demonstrate proper pipe cleaning procedures and the utilization of some of the specialty tools that are required for, for pipe cleaning today. You know, it's an above ground collection system that is hands on and very, very visual. All of our training programs incorporate classroom and hands on uh, programs into the training program. Our customer retention or ability to take that knowledge and take it into the field has been uh, uh, very, very successful. Um, the products that Jack Doheny Supplies represents or has available to rent range from our, our Cusco DOT-coated debris bodies with basic industrial vacuum loaders 
to advanced vacuum loading systems from hydro trenchers to turbo vacs. Our press vac product lines represent some of the uh, industry's most specialized DOT coated vacuum units with a wide variety of vacuum options. Our guzzler product lines represent units with wet dry capabilities with advanced bag house filtration systems. We have units available for rent that are have high rail gears. We've got liquid ring vacuum blowers for specialty vacuum applications as well as hydro excavators. Our sewer equipment company of uh, America products range from trailer jets to truck jets to easement units with capacities ranging from 300 to 2,000 gallon water tank capacities. Our Vactor product line offers the most advanced and the most complete line of hydro excavation equipment available, as well as the industry's leading and most advanced uh, combination sewer cleaning line. Our combination sewer cleaners uh, range uh, with a variety of vacuum systems from centrifugal compressor to, to very large positive displacement blowers. Uh, the line cleaning capabilities on these units range from 60 gallons a minute to 120 gallons a minute. The Proteus Mini Cam is a brand new product that we introduced at the Pumper Show uh, just a couple of weeks ago. The Proteus product uh, camera system is the industry's only uh, battery powered mainline inspection system. The module that you see to your right also has a built-in computer and software package with a data recorder that is uh, PACP compatible. Uh, the EBOC product line is the industry's most advanced pipeline inspection system. The, uh, the lateral inspection system, the LISI system, offers the most effective lateral inspection in the industry, as well as the Panorama system, which is the industry's only completely digital inspection system. The Jack Ramey companies all the products and then some that you just looked at are available to rent. We have the, the most aggressive, most advanced rental system and rental fleet available. So if you have the need for an inspection piece of equipment, a cleaning piece of equipment, or a piece of vacuum equipment, all you have to do is give us a call. And one of our 18 locations, we can get you the equipment uh, almost overnight. And uh, again, we'd like to thank NASCO and WEF for sponsoring such an important program and allowing us to be part of it. Hey, th thanks, Dan. Our next sponsor is T4 Spatial, and it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Richards. Uh, Ed actually recently provided us with a technical presentation about the use of asset management software at NASCO's annual conference. Ed? Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, once again, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar, and thank you so much for allowing T4 Spatial the opportunity to be one of your sponsors. Um, T4 Spatial uh, creates a cloud-based uh, integration platform to integrate disparate data from asset for asset management. Uh, CCTV data, GIS data, operation and maintenance data, engineering, uh, flow modeling, compliance data, it's all geospatial and is NASCO certified at least at the 6.0 level. Uh, the ability to analyze prioritize and manage workflows from just your browser using data, heavy data, video storage in the cloud, um, integrated with your GIS and allowing for analytics uh, and uh, filter planning, workflow management, task management, uh, uh, visible anywhere from any device, anytime. The, this, these all add up into an architecture that looks similar to this slide here where the truck itself is uh, streaming data from the, the uh, inspection process, whether it's a truck or some other form of, of capture technology, into the cloud, automatically synchronized with the GIS, integrated with third-party asset management and work order system, all user-friendly uh, by a, by via a browser by any of the stakeholders on the right here to consume and analyze and make decisions. A quick overview of the, of, the, of the product, I'm going to drill into the actual web-based product online here and log into the product uh, with just a standard browser. This is uh, Santa Cruz from the county of Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, and so it takes me geospatially into that area. If I open up all the pipeline inspections that are relative to 
this particular uh, area, you can see on the line all the icons represent uh, a video inspection. If I turn on the pipe manholes and GIS data consumed for pipes and, and manholes and zoom into a particular area, you can see that everything is done on a pipe, uh, a, a manhole, uh, a, a manhole to manhole basis with a pipe segment in between, in between, and then a video inspection. Uh, and if there was all the history be there, they'd be more represented. Clicking on the icon allows us to see the high-level structural. PACP, O&M, and Sprawl Pipe Index, as well as open the inspection, stream it from the into your browser, and actually allow the, the consumer to, to, to consume the actual live uh, live video or, or the historical video, make, make certain changes to the inspection in terms of uh, speed, override the uh, volume controls, look at all the PACP data that's captured from the all the observations that are done in the field, Editing of the observations is, 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 is allowed. Um, tagging the inspections with follow-up activities like lining or spot repair or grouting or excavation. And also viewing the history of the, the inspection. Um, the tabs also allow you to copy the URL and send the link to, to a third party and have that person be able to open up the inspection along with you and collaborate on the repair and remediation efforts or print the inspection in, a, in an HTML5 generated report that's 6.0, uh, uh, version 6.0, giving you all the high level data, including you know follow-up activities, uh, scores, observations, uh, comments, and line diagram, including camera location taps, uh, uh, camera flow, and photos. This can, this can be up, can be put on your flipboard and, and emailed to others to for, for folks to use. You can also do um, uh, it, it queries into the data, and in the interest of time here, I'm just going to do one query, and then I'm going to turn this back over to um, Ted. But in terms of looking at the, some 900 inspections here, we look at a query in term, terms of pipeline conditions. And if we bring up in the browser, we have all of the pipeline condition code uh, it, it, as of 6.0, and we can't wait to add the new code uh, for 7.0. Uh, and if we grab into, uh, say, you know, rooted areas or point repairs, or I, I, I grab roots and, and check off the root code, uh, the root codes here, and query in. And from my from some, some 900 inspections, I have 139 conditions that meet this time and root. But if I want to go in and maybe look at an, an overall grade, maybe I'll only look at the threes to fives and add those into my inspection. And very easily, you can see 39 conditions. Easy to create a report. I'm doing this all online and dynamically and live. I create the report, open the report, generate the report, and you end up with um, all your inspections uh, that, that meet a particular uh, requirement, this requirement. So this is uh, essentially um, the, the T4. Uh, a product line. There's a, a bunch more to show you. I urge you to contact me at your any time you wish um, to to um, uh, for for a demonstration or further information. Thank you so much for allowing people to be one of your sponsors. Thanks, Ed. Um, and and again, thanks, Jack DeHaney and T4 Spatial for uh, sponsoring this webcast. Also, want to thank our our speakers, uh, Gina Snyder from EPA, Luis Leon from CDM Smith. Laurie Perkins from Wright Pierce and Jim Harris. Uh, I want to thank everyone for calling in, and I just want to leave you with it. There were a lot of questions. We did not get to all of them. Um, we'll try to get follow up with answers to, to some of those questions, um, you know, when we can, and, and, and get back to you. Um, and that's all we have. Thanks again for for calling in.